All right, everybody, we should be live for our weekly show here on the Game Wisdom channel. Welcome, this is for the week of July 19th, 2020. It's been another very hot week around here, and we have some very interesting game design topics to discuss. Joining me, as always, is my co-host, indie developer, Sharky. How are you doing? Uh, getting by. Mm-hmm. If it's going to be one of those very, I think, challenging summers, I guess, for us, right? I mean, every every summer is challenging mm-hmm. when you when you hate the heat. Oh yes, and it looks like it's going to be another very uh, hot one. I think it was like ninety three, ninety four this week, and I apparently am now super sensitive to the sun, even more than I thought. So that's going to be fun. Yeah, I mean, like you you've gained this superpower now. Mm-hmm. Can I trade that for another one? No. No trade backs. Uh, but uh, we have some very great discussions planned, and our main topic this week is going to be talking about player retention and the ways to keep somebody invested in your game and what will drive them away. And yeah, and one key thing that we need to keep in mind is I'm not an expert in this topic. This is, you know, sort of outside of my knowledge base, but parts of my knowledge will probably apply to this and I'll probably learn stuff that I already knew just by tackling it from a different direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, thank you for that, uh, uh, Ford. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a winter man myself. (laughs) I'm a spring fall person. So, before we get to that, let's talk some news and see what crazy games are coming out this week. So, uh, one thing that I thought was very interesting is that uh, there was an interview with Sony regarding cross-gen games, or games that can be released on the PlayStation 4 as well as the PlayStation 5, and they are, at least with the PlayStation 5, saying that they do not want... Uh, cross-generation games. They feel that it's, according to them, quote, it stifles innovation. And I think I do agree with this, that if you are going to design games for, you know, quote-unquote next-gen, then it should be a next-gen game. I I guess, what do you think about this one, Shark? Well, I I, I think the stifles innovation is just a line from Sony. Mm Mm-hmm. Basically, what it does is you have your 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 super HD version on PlayStation Five and your less HD version on PlayStation Four, or you just get the less HD version on both. And Sony doesn't want that because, as we know, aesthetics sell games mm-hmm. to a point, and they want the maximum level of aesthetics, so they don't want. A lesser, you know, if somebody looks up the game and they have a PlayStation 5, but they see the game being played on PlayStation 4, they don't want that. They also don't want, you know, their PlayStation 5 copy to get PlayStation 4 graphics. Mm-hmm. That That's that's their whole thought about that. I, it's not going to stifle any innovation kind of thing because, I mean, what's new besides updated specs? I mean... Mm-hmm. I mean, updated specs more than likely isn't going to change how a developer develops a game. I mean, they do it on PC all the time. It's the same game. You just you set the settings down lower kind of thing for the lower specs. Mm-hmm. Not going to hurt innovation. Having AAAs on your platform and no, no indies kind of thing, or very few indies, that's going to stop for innovation. <laughs> I just hope we finally get more in terms of, you know, backwards compatibility or making these more universal. And yeah, you know, Sony used to be really good at that, yeah. and then they 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 stopped being the good guy and started being the bad guy. Yeah. And they're 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 not. I don't think they're going to head out of that good guy uh, the bad guy spot anytime soon. Maybe in PlayStation Six, but not 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 in PlayStation Five because I mean. Xbox is going for the good guy merits in 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 this generation. Mm. 
And, uh, you know, where PlayStation was going for the good guy merits in one and two, PlayStation one and two, and then they went bad in three and then went even worse <laughs> in four. And I, I think they're going to go even worse in five. But, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, six, they'll decide to be the good guys again. Mm-hmm. Because it benefits them, because their sales are declining, because Xbox is a good guy in this generation, and PlayStation is not. So everybody goes to Xbox, and you know, starts you start seeing declining sales on the Sony side, and they're like, "Hey, you know what? Maybe we should be the good guys again. We'll be the good guys, get the sales, and then once he gets the hook, go right back to the bad guy." Mm-hmm. Eh, we shall see. In terms of game releases, we had two very big ones, I guess, this week. Ghost of Tsushima and the new Paper Mario game that I completely and utterly forgot about that was even coming out. I didn't even hear about that one. Yep. Paper Mario and the Origami King, I believe, is the title. And people are arguing, is it an RPG? Is it not an RPG? Because apparently there's no experience. Well, what makes good guy versus bad guy is consumer friendly versus versus anti consumer, mm-hmm. and good versus bad is relative because I mean they're 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 both have elements of both. We're just talking about if you look at an overall view of you know good guy bad guy kind of thing, you know black and white. If you take it into black and white, this next generation Xbox has made themselves out to be the good guy and Sony has made themselves out to be the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Last generation I think but they both made themselves out to be the bad guy. But Xbox sort of backed off on a lot of that bad guy stuff and Sony did not. But it didn't didn't do well for for Xbox last season. Last mm. console another- generation. Another way to describe it would be maybe something like white hat and black hat design. Or kind of, you know, how you approach designing or, you know, what you're doing for the consumer. Uh, yeah. To David's question, first Paper Mario was okay. It was a thou- the Thousand Year Door. That was the second one. That's one that kind of solidified the franchise. And then it's been kind of a wishy-washy ever since. Did not like a sticker star saga. Yeah. I've never gotten into any of the Paper Marios, but I did utterly love, uh, what was it, uh, Super Mario RPG? Mm-hmm. The first one, the one where Square Enix, or Squaresoft? Yep. Not Square Enix, Squaresoft, the that good is. company. <laughs> not that could be confused with the bad company. The good company, you know, combined with Mario and everything, and like, that, that game was amazing. I love that one. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, one of my favorites as well. I think I actually managed to do that, like, 50 jump challenge once to get, like, <laughs> the best item in the game or one of the best ones. <laughs> and reports are coming about ghosts or ghosts of Shusima that they're saying it's a beautiful looking game, but it's not the deepest. It looks kind of like all the other open world games that we've played. Yeah, I don't know anything about that game, though. <laughs> so I can't really say anything. Let's see. Anything else happening this week? Uh, uh, Paradox did b- that Surviving the Aftermath game that we tried that one night. Apparently, Paradox has actually bought the studio. Hmm. Let's see. And... Uh, that company was a tiny build. They're going like all in with that Hello Neighbor. I think they bought the company for that. Yeah, here's Tiny Build Nabs Hello Neighbor Dev Team, and they were going to do a fifteen million dollar investment in that franchise. I really don't know about that one. Well, I mean that thing has a massive fan base, but like, like I've I've watched so much on it. Mm-hmm. And I haven't enjoyed any of it that I watched. What I have enjoyed is the you know the theory videos based around it. <laughs> that has nothing to do with oh. well, I wouldn't say nothing to do, but it, it's not the game itself. It's just videos around it. And then after a certain point, those got old, and I stopped watching those too. Mm-hmm. 
It just the seems game, like the never... <laughs> it, it seems like the diet version of Five Nights at Freddy's to me. I don't know about that. I think it's more like like it has that same kind of mystery and everything that Five Nights at Freddy's does. Mm -hmm. But I think they do stuff better to a point. But it's still Five Nights at Freddy's. It's 3D Five Nights at Freddy's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. It's Five Nights at Freddy's with better aesthetics <laughs> and a different theme. So they've Confirm there's going to be a Hello Neighbor board game, there's going to be a graphic novel, and apparently they did a animated series as well. Mm. Oh, no. You know what that means. We need to have our own... We need to create a Game Wisdom board game, I think. And what are we going to do? Like, like, <laughs> like, we do it like a Monopoly kind of thing, and you can, you know, instead of like Community Chess and Chance... We got the, you know, the Josh and the, the Sharky piles. You mm. draw a Sharky card or draw a Josh card to figure out what your fate will be. Yeah. And the Josh cards are all going to be masochistic choices. <laughs> yeah. I should get a Stanley Pearson. He could design it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's some cross-marketing potential. I would say the graphic novel, but then discussing that will probably earn us some DMODs. <laughs> yeah. I just do not... Again, like, I tried it, and I'm like... It's a game, like... Again, like, stuff like Five Nights at Freddy's, Hello Neighbor... I... It, it seems like people are just, like, forcing the heck out of trying to make those, like, massive properties. Yeah. Well, they, they've already got a massive fan base and everything. They're just trying to take advantage of it by blowing it up, kind of thing. <laughs> and... I'm pretty sure a lot of that's going to fall flat on its face, like the the animated series. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see an animated series of that going anywhere. That's going to be, you know, I, I picture that, you know, ten years after it, it it comes out and everything, and people post an image of that. What the heck is that? Where the heck did mm -hmm. that come from? I've never. Mm -hmm. It'll be, you know, one of those lost in forever kind of thing, just like uh, some other. You know, like the original Mario movie kind of thing. <laughs> I see it going that kind of direction. And uh, Ford brought up, of course, the game Gamer Girl. That's mm -hmm. earning some controversies. It's a game... F, it's a, I only watched... I was like watching some of the trailer for... I kept the sound off to retain sanity. You're the moderator for a imaginary Twitch streamer who apparently tells her everything to do. Yeah. Mm. It, it, from what I can see, it feels like a twine game crossed with a, you know, which, you know, is a text-based choice game. Mm -hmm. With, with uh, cross, you know, same thing as, uh, 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 what's it going to call it? Uh, now I'm forgetting. The, Choose the your one adventure? That was, no, the really popular one. that Disco went Elysium? Off that, yeah, Disco Elysium. It's like Disco Elysium crossed with a with a uh, FMV game kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like to me. That's what it seems like to me is Disco Elysium meets a FMV game, <laughs> which is an interesting concept, but the subject matter is like, eh? Like, you yeah. know, I, 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 I have a feeling like either, you know, Either they were really close to a situation similar to this, or or they were just trying to you know get free publicity, and we're giving it to them right here mm -hmm. by so, making something controversial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course you have people saying, you know, it's going to be sexist and degrading to women because it's going to paint them all as you know, you know. Uh, just like whoring up on Which, camera. No, it's it's not. It's going to paint most girl streamers as that way. Mm -hmm. Which there are a lot of girl streamers that are that way. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it would be painting a pretty true picture for probably what eighty percent, mm. something like that. 
And but of course, course, you know, the other 20% will be, you know, completely different and completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're legitimate streamers kind of thing. And, you know, if only Twitch moderated the platform, we wouldn't have that kind of 80%. But they don't. Yeah. They don't do a lot of things that are good. They do a lot of things that are bad, though. And that's the reason why I will no longer return to Twitch to do streaming despite my follower count over there. Yeah, I Unless I literally have no cho other choice. I still have people subscribing to me. Not It doesn't earn me any money because I'm not a partner, but people are still subscribing over there even though I haven't done a Twitch stream in a year and a half or two years. I thought it was longer than that. Well, I had to do like an emergency one when YouTube went down. Ah. Yeah. And if, I don't know, it just seems like a very weird game to put out right now, other than if you're trying to stoke controversy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, like, it doesn't look like it's, you know, like all the controversy and everything, it looks like it's not going to be that wild of a game kind of thing. Yeah, well, but, like, they're, they, the, the topic definitely, you know, stirs controversy, but I don't think there's going to be. All that much, I don't think the controversy is going to get be actually too bad in the gameplay. But mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, that's just that's just my my theory. I'm crafting kind of thing. I don't think it's. I think they're trying to. You know, if I had to guess, I think they're either trying to tell a legitimate story because they had an experience close to you know along these lines kind of thing, or they're they're trying to make a game and it's like how do we get people to notice our game let's do a controversy and then let's like not give them much ammo to shoot at us once we once it does come out and people play it mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that second one is probably the the real what would actually happen with it <laughs> all right but I think with that let's get to some weird games and see what is coming out because I do want to get to our main topic because I think this is going to be a really good one. So, let's get ready for some more. Do you think we'll get any controversial games coming out? Probably. <laughs> yeah, of how we do things because it seems to do better that mm -hmm. way. All right. So, right off the bat, like, this is one of those cases of really good thumbnail. Not exactly the game looking all that impressive. Which one, Scar? Yeah. Like, this is the footage of the in-game. It looks very, like, stock asset to me. Yeah, it does. Apparently it's in early access. Of course, it can look that way without actually being that way, but it, you know, what matters is that it looks that way because that's what a lot of people are going to see it as. <laughs> Just how a lot of people see my game, my last game is an asset flip, even though there was basically no assets. I mean, there was a couple, there was the title screen <laughs> and some sound effects, but you know, that's it. <laughs> But they weren't talking about... They, those were the things they weren't talking about. They were talking about the actual gameplay, and there was yeah. no assets in there. So this one caught my eye, because I think I own the first Dead Age, or I may have played it a long time ago. I so, think I might own it, too. Roguelike turn-based combat with role-playing games. I like the combat system. Final Fantasy X meets Darkest Dungeon. That's a, a very descriptive <laughs> line right there. Yeah. Do we need to tell people that they shouldn't be doing descriptions like that? Maybe. Because that tells me absolutely nothing about the combat. Unless you played Final Fantasy X and Darkest Dungeon and mm -hmm. know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. 3D-based management. Here's kind of my problem with that. There's no screenshot showing me the base management. This is all we get. 
Is there not any on the top layer? It is just a, tra a launch trailer. Hmm. Yeah, they needed some screenshots in there too. Mm-hmm. Let's see, that We Should Talk game, I know I looked at that as one of the uh, Steam festivals. Yeah, X meets Y can be very misleading. Because you don't know what parts of them that you're taking. What the heck yep. is... Coming? Because you could be taking the worst parts from this one and the worst parts from this one and putting them together. Hmm. Or the best parts from this one and the best parts from this one and putting them together. You never know. I, lo I like this idea that you're watching these VHS tapes and it's a horror game. My one concern is I think this aesthetic's going to give a lot of people headaches. Because this looks very horror in your eyes. It's loading on my side. Alright. Oh, now it's, it's back. Now it's back. Alright. Yeah, that was weird. I think that was an OBS uh, issue because I didn't lose any connection. And now I'm in 144p. Uh-huh. Time to upgrade my P. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Everybody. There's our D mod for the day. Uh <laughs> Soul Scafe. Oh wait, this is one we looked at last week. I don't know, should I put in a press key for that horror game? Eh, yeah, you sure. can. It wouldn't hurt. My, well, it might hurt, but my that eyes. would be beneficial to you. Yeah. Mighty Fling. So it looks like kind of like that Jump King game. Hmm. Yeah, and back to the point Rastal Rat Stal was talking about. I hope I said that right. The, the other issue with that is you can't depend on every player reading your page to have played those two games. Mm-hmm. Or even one of them. Because I've, I've played Final Fantasy X, never played Darkest Dungeon. Yeah. I'm sure there's many people out there that's played Darkest Dungeons, never played Final Fantasy X. I mean, like, are we, are we limiting ourselves to only selling this game to people who have played both games at the same time? Because that's I, going to drastically cut down the audience. I have no idea what's going on in this thumbnail. And that is not what I, I was expecting from that thumbnail. <laughs> that That is very, very different. Okay. Work trip. There's that fashion business game again. Are you going to get into the fashion business? No. Golf Toby, I got a press key for this one. We'll be taking a look at this on Wednesday. Neon Cyborg Cat Cat Club. That was not easy to say. It's a relaxation simulator. Now that, that sounds like a game where you do nothing in it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Can't you read his Dark Souls meets? Thank you. Liquid Sunshine. Hmm. Inspired by games like Lost Vikings and Limbo. Now that would be a way to do it. Is inspired by that, and then and then give details on what actually it is. Hmm. Three players are a monkey, a horse, and a rhino. No shark, though. Uh, May the I shark don't think I'll be DLC. I'll, I'll wait for the DLC before I play it. Hmm, that could be interesting. Only when they get the DLC. <laughs> <laughs> Vertigo Remass Shivering Hearts is a light horror role playing game. I think we looked at this one. Hand drawn. I do like watercolor aesthetics. Oh goodness, 120 possible <laughs> ending combinations. <laughs> Lisa, well, the, the the more important thing here, Rat, is that you're you're learning. Hopefully. <laughs> 
It's research. Yeah. Christopia? Looks like a mobile esque kind of game. Let's see. Can you possibly explore solve your own way through our plans? Five or three expansion and beautifully crafted chapters is an independent sequel to a game that I've never heard of. Hmm. Third person point and click adventure. Okay. Ooh, variations of puzzles. Be challenged by a variation of puzzles. That does not sound right. Uh, what part of it? The part that you're only going to be playing variations of the same puzzle and not new puzzles, or the fact that the way the English was written? Or and the fact that certain words are capitalized, other ones... Why All three, it? then. Yeah. Quash. Hmm. Sunway, Endless Bow. We looked at rain swept already. Ooh, five dimensional chess. We could play that. Yeah, I mean you you're 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 an expert in the uh fifth dimension. Mm-hmm. Doctor Adamus. Alien Cat Five. Apparently we missed the first four. It's lay at the bomb. Wait, did we look at this one, Vagris? Yes, yes we did. Huh? Yeah, I think we looked at that one last week. It steals. Yeah, a lot of puzzle games seem to run that problem of not actually being puzzles and just being trying to figure out what the developer wanted you to do here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not actually Ooh, a puzzle. Two. Where do I, I get that key that. for carrion? Pill pop. A yeah, false that's pill. good design. Wait, what was that toxicant? Am I going to regret clicking on this? Nope. Formerly undermine. Oh, I bet because uh, underminer probably is more recognizable. Mm hmm. Randomized levels. And again, but Undermine has already come out. Yeah, I think it's officially out in August, like third. I like this screenshot. Can you tell what's happening? Um, you're taking damage from some enemy behind you, or an invisible enemy, mm. or whatever those blobs are on the screen. I like this screenshot as well. It's very descriptive. Oh yeah. Like, like I, I was looking at another developer posting a sh screenshot of something, and it was almost pitch black dark, like that one. I was like, you might want a little bit more lighting. Mm -hmm. Ambient lighting, so you, you don't have to get rid of the flashlight, but you don't have to provide more light, but, you know, maybe a little bit more ambient lighting. The Spoon of Doom. That sounds safely extreme. Spoon of Doom is a game maze. Wait, so we're collecting the Spoons of Doom, or are we fighting the Spoons of Doom? If you fight the Spoons of Doom, are you doing it with the fork of... Light, life? I don't know. And where does the, the, the case knife of neutrality fall into this? Max and the Book of Chaos. RK 2D game. Hmm. Main references Metal Slug. Never heard of Bug Butcher. The art looks okay. I kind of get like a Cuphead kind of vibe. I don't get Cuphead, but like, I get. Very kind of cartoony. Mm hmm. I don't know what game to match that up with. But definitely not Cuphead. I mean, Cuphead was cartoony, but it was 40s cartoons. This is definitely not 40s cartoons. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of, um, 
like the art of something like Day of the Tentacle or you know like the old Lucas Arts kind of games. Yeah, if that was done in current day, it'd yeah. probably look something like this. All right. I'll put in for it. Wonder if it's multiplayer. Pitcher and the Whale. Put Pitcher's book in water and bring it to the whale. Ooh. So I guess you have to keep the whale alive. Sounds like a well of a good time. Mm hmm. Will a shark eat him? Maybe. Vibrant Adventure. Single player 2D adventure platformer. So is it a Metroidvania? Doesn't look too bad. Yeah, it has potential. Okay, so you have two character. Wait, what is it? Four playable characters with two unique abilities. I could see it becoming a little hard to control. You have to swap between all four to solve any given room. Hmm. Well, he said there's only two unique abilities. Mm hmm. So, so you probably eight. wouldn't have to. You probably wouldn't. Each character has two unique abilities. Yeah, four with each with two unique abilities. So that'll be oh. eight different mechanics. I was thinking that it was two different mechanics. Period between the four different characters. No. Uh, hmm. So like, two of the characters are cosmetic only, basically. Could be another interesting one to watch. Yeah. Suicide Guy, another one. What trash? Okay. Toilet Paper Unleashed. Okay, we gotta see this one. Explore two levels of Toilet Paper Searching Madness. Okay. This looks like a winner right here. You know, this is... They, they really missed out on their name. You know, this should be... Corona Simulator. <laughs> Early day Corona Simulator. <laughs> Painted Legend 2. Sorry for what? Definitely not clicking. If, if a thing has an 18 plus patch, we're definitely not clicking on that. Oh, come on. You want to find out what the Dragon's Treasure is, don't you? Mm hmm. And then get banned from YouTube for a few days. Can Too can much, the baby. game. Greedy maze. Why is everyone making a maze game now? Is that the new hotness? I don't know, but I mean, like, I need to go back to my maze game. Apparently, I guess everyone, did everyone get tired of Cyberpunk. <laughs> the real treasure's goal we found along the way. Exactly. What 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 if what if uh, you know we did a Cyberpunk maze game? There you go. Endless Bounty. Let's see. I'm fine with everybody abandoning Cyberpunk. I don't want the store to be flooded. Wait, it's a point-and-click adventure game. 20-plus achievements. Oof. Maybe fine romance. What do you think of the art in this one? But the 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 when there's not characters on the screen, you know, big characters, mm -hmm. I really like it. But the big characters, uh, they don't fit. It looks like a different style. Yeah, it is. Yeah, like I think but, if the game if the the game looked more like like with this detail would be better, or make the characters look more like the game. I think that way the second would be better. Mm -hmm. Because I think the game itself looks pretty decent. Two to four hours of gameplay with good reasons to play through multiple times. Hmm. Yeah, like the pixel art is not bad. Yeah. You can kind of see them repeating the background though here. Yeah, it is a little bit too repetitive. 
<laughs> but it's not bad. Strip naked card game. I'm pretty sure there's a there must be at least fifty of those by now. Yeah. And that'll be a that'll be a DLC for Project Triad. There you go. Really bad flying machine. Kong Fusion. Oh. Kung Fu Madness in virtual reality. Hmm. One well, of these days, we need, we should try to get some of the VR developers on and talk to them about their games. Radar oh, you're kind of you're kind of sort of doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're putting out doing a VR port, for to try it. But that 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 felt that 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 game felt so much like just like Beat Saber with the different aesthetic on top of it. <laughs> The, the fighting and everything. Look at it again. It'll, yeah, it had it, that... it, it very much Beat Saber with a different aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Don't want to click on E Girl. That could be trouble. Well, why yeah. don't you want to do E Girl? Yeah, and you can tell that, you know, the blue enemies have to hit him with the right weapon, red enemies have to hit with the left. Uh huh, and you got to dodge the walls, the electric walls. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like the same exact... It looks like a clone with a different aesthetic. Oh, my God. I like that first line, which I have to scroll down to avoid getting into trouble. Mm -mm. I was not expecting that with this thumbnail. I missed it. Oh, good. Well, maybe I won't get into trouble then. <laughs> Ageless. Puzzle platforming. Age of animals and plant life. Huh, that could be interesting. Equipment is below. I kind of missed what the solution was there. So she hits that. Hmm. And she wall jumps. The pixel art looks kind of basic to me. Yeah. That's, it's not bad art, but it's not good art either. Yeah. You it's, know what that means. Yeah. You know, not bad art is, you know, in today's market, basically the same thing as an asset flip. Mm. Not quite, but not I mean, a whole lot of difference. I see potential to gameplay. Yeah. Eh, but you know somebody will complain and say, is this an asset flip? Oh, yeah. Huh. Probably several people. I like this gif right here, the tree. That looks pretty nice. It's hand-drawn pixel, it says. Hmm. All right. I think I'll put in for it. I'm guessing the sales aren't going to go well on it, though. Mm. Destroy all humans. Alright. And I think this will be the last page and we'll get to our topic. Grounded? I don't know. I tried that ground game. I was just not feeling it. But, again, I'm not a survival game fan, so I'm, I, I may not be the right market one. for it. Was I on when you did that? I don't know. It was the one that was like, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I don't remember it. Either I probably wasn't digging it, or I wasn't there. Probably one of the two. Because hmm. I am very much one of the people into survival. This and I remember you playing some survival game at one point that I was not particularly fond of. Was it the Volcano one? I don't remember which one it was. Because I kind of just dropped it out of my memory. <laughs> hmm. Bladebound is a multiplayer dungeon crawler. Explore handcrafted dungeons. Hmm. This looks alright. 
I don't know how repetitive it's gonna be if they are all handcrafted dungeons. Yeah. What do you mean, Mojo? Hmm. Alright. Tale of Ninja. Pink gum. Each sail I blow a balloon. There we go. That's gonna be the game of the year. Uh, totally the game of the year. Game of the century. Wind Peaks. Oh, He's search. gonna blow up, what, two balloons? Three balloons? There is something wrong with these uh, thumbnails right now, aren't there? <laughs> or maybe there's not. You think something with Keymailer? No, it may be something with the game. Well, that's a fast difference. Yeah. It maybe doesn't... maybe something with Keymailer, or maybe they just didn't fully fill out their thing. Hmm. I do like these uh, hidden object kind of games, but they're not exactly the most exciting to watch on stream. Well, I don't, but it looked graphically interesting. Fight Crab, Dragon Blaze. Oh, this is a uh, re-release. I really want to see the Fight Crab. Is there a Fight Shark? What the? There might be. Ooh, powered by simulated physics. This is a game that I saw, I think like this was another like YouTuber bait kind of game. Oh yeah, that is very YouTuber bait. Oof. Oh, I, I had a feeling it was gonna be a VR version. VR link up with Vroid? Okay. Crap wave wave. <laughs> there we go. Does that come with synth? <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's a steam maybe it's a uh, cyberpunk game. I thought you were about to say steampunk. I was. I was like Steampunk Cyberpunk, there you go. Steampunk crabs. There we go. Well, I that just... would just be steam crabs. <laughs> No, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> All right. But uh, let's get to our topic then for the week. We got at least some potentially good-looking games. Some of those puzzle platformers look nice. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about player retention. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this topic is that I was playing this game called East Shade. And this was kind of like a... Uh, open world, you're a painter or an artist trying to explore this land. It is highly celebrated, or according to Steam, it has Steam decides to load, it has over 2,400 reviews that are all very positive. So, you would think this would be a very celebrated game. Mm -hmm. So, I played it, and within about 30 minutes, I realized I don't want to play this game anymore. It's more about, you know, a walking simulator. Like, very basic movement as well. So I returned it. But here's the interesting point. This is why I want to talk about this topic. I'm looking at the Steam achievements, which I'm loving this feature as I'm, like, examining these games more. 94% of the people who bought the game actually made it to the open made it through the opening. Literally the first cutscene. 94% <laughs> of the people actually did that. Mm -hmm. And then one of the first achievements in the game, building your first tent that I think occurs probably 40 minutes to an hour in, only 16.7% of the players actually made it out of the opening of the game. Mm. And that drop-off is just astounding to me. Because if you think about it, if over what do I say? Over 2,000 people like the game, only 18% of the player base actually may have passed an hour playing this game. You know, just off of that, I'm, I'm guessing two things. Mm -hmm. 
I'm guessing that it had a really good aesthetic. Eh, a little bit. And I'm guessing that the gameplay was really crap. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing that a lot of people gave it a good review score because of the aesthetics. And nobody kept on playing it because the gameplay was crap. Yeah. And, like, somebody commented on Twitter saying that they really love the game. They played it all the way through. But they also had issues with movement and controls as well. So that person may be part of that 18% who may have passed the first point. And They're probably part of the .001% that got the last achievement. Mm-hmm. And as a point of comparison, looking at Curse of the Moon 2, that is considered uh, the main uh, issue with that is the high difficulty. At least 38% of the player base managed to beat the first episode of the game. And mm -hmm. as a point of comparison, that game is up to 374 reviews and are considered very positive. So, the people, more people who bought Curse of the Moon 2 made it further than they would have played East Shade, East Shade. But there's a larger pool of people who played or who bought East Shade. Mm hmm. And as we talked before, gameplay doesn't sell games. Mm hmm. Sadly. Yeah. Because no trailer you make. No screenshot you make can ever really convey your gameplay. I mean, maybe you can convey one mechanic in your your trailer. Maybe you can convey the genre through your trailer and screenshots. Mm -hmm. But but that that's it. That's it. The only way they're going to experience your gameplay is if they actually buy your game and play it. Mm -hmm. Now they in a way to experience your aesthetics. They can do that plenty well through your your trailer and your your screenshots, and that's how you get them to buy the game, which is really sad. Yeah. And again, like when I'm looking at these achievements and seeing just the drop off rates of these games, this is why I wanted to discuss about player retention because is this is one of those topics that I feel is kind of like the silent killer for a lot of these games. Because you'll see, again, developers and critics praise games, you know, for being, you know, very artistic, very cinematic, and then you, when you look at look them up for reality, you see that maybe 5-10% of the player base actually may have actually played through that game. And conversely, you'll see for challenging titles, you know, the uh, La Mulanas, Dark Souls, games like that, the ones that just go for deeply above all else, that people will praise them, and then you'll see maybe only 10 or even less than 10% of the player base actually seeing those games all the way through to the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what we talk about with a lot of our discussions here, that if you don't understand what keeps people playing you're going to end up in that echo chamber effect and you're going to make the same mistakes over and over again. Yep. And the... So, the first key is you've got to hook the player in the first few minutes. Mm -hmm. Which, to hook the player, you need really, you need good enough aesthetics, which is going to be depending on player to player, and of course, you had to have good enough aesthetics to get them to purchase the game to begin with, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to have enough wow factor, enough, oh, I love this mechanic, oh, I love this, oh, I love that, in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes of gameplay. Because after that point, if they're not super impressed, they're not going to keep on playing. And uh, to a rat's tail point about, you know, didn't, like the tour, yeah, there are people, like we've said before, the amount of time somebody's willing to spend on your game is getting less and less 
with so many games being released. For myself, I've said this before, you have 15 to 30 minutes to convince me to play your game. It doesn't yeah. matter if you have the best game ever made. If I'm already tired of your game after 15 minutes, or in some cases 5 or 10 minutes, I'm done. Like, I don't want to sit around and play that game, because guess what? I have over 2,000 games I have to play on Steam. Yeah, not only that, but if you talk about, like, publicity and YouTubers and whatnot, mm. like, you know, several of them won't give your game more than five minutes. Oh, yes. And, you know, like, that and game... They uh, may be looking for anything they can crap on in that first five minutes, too. Mm-hmm. That game that I played last night, the, uh, I already forgot the name of it, was it The Way? That, uh, RTS uh, with a bug game. Like, I was, you know, already, like, on a downward spiral after about two minutes with that UI. And then, uh, and then I just said, you know what, I'm done with this. And I'm sure there are people who quit it far sooner than I did. Yeah. I think this is a moment for you do not know the way. <laughs> there we go. So here's another like, interesting statistic that I looked up. That I went to La Mulana 2. And a higher player count or a higher amount of people got further in that game. Like the drop off for the achievements is not as steep or not as, you know, going from 90 to 16 as East Shade. And I think part of that, again, again, and this is where this issue comes into play with why to do these onboarding and approachability, is that I am very sure that the people who bought La Mulana 2 were already experts of La Mulana 1. Like, they knew what they were getting into. But... Mm -hmm. Again, this is why these issues of approachability matter. Is that you can improve your game without diluting it. And it all comes down to being able to understand the onboarding practice. Well, I mean, that's one aspect of it for mm -hmm. sure. But you also have other aspects, like the hooking the player. Mm hmm and the aesthetics, the wow factor, you know, it's not just aesthetics, it's, you know, animations, and it falls into many categories, but just getting that wow factor, you know, kind of thing. You you can wow them through story, you can wow them through, through many other ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, but if your stories really feels generic in the first five, ten minutes, your, your, your UI feels really generic, all this stuff feels really generic in the first five, ten minutes of the game, they're going to drop off. And if they drop off, then then it's a percentage chance, and I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a percentage chance that they're going to refund your game. Mm -hmm. And this is why when we talk about retention, that we see a lot of, this is why most AAA games are that very bombastic opening. You know, Uncharted, Tomb Raider, The Last of Us. You know, that you're going to begin this game in this explosion of action and very scripted events. And then, you know, the game settles down maybe 30 minutes to 40 minutes in. And then that's the main gameplay loop. But again, it's all about hooking the player to begin with. Yep. Like God of War had you fight a, a giant in one of their games in their intro in their first, like, 5-10 minutes. Yeah. And again, because it's... What's more epic than fighting a freaking giant? Yeah. And again, that's the point. You know, why start your game with Kratos, you know, doing his taxes for an hour when you can start with him ripping the heads off of Hydra? Yeah. Although now we need to see that. Kratos doing his taxes. Kratos tax simulator. Mm-hmm. Now... 2020. Yep. Yeah. We gotta have multiple editions. And yep. like you said, there's a lot of different aspects when it comes to player retention. Again, I, I feel like this could be a two parter topic. We'll see how far we can get into with it. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're phone <laughs> axe cleaner. And the point is that there's a lot of intersecting aspects that make this work. As you said, there's the aesthetic 
you know, how does this game look? If you from the weird game segment, we saw some games that from a gameplay perspective look really amazing, but from an aesthetic standpoint, they are not really hooking the player. And again, like when we talk about this, we're not insulting, you know, the developers or the artists. We're just looking at does this pop? Does this look like something that somebody's going to click on the Steam page, take one look at your game, and go, wow? You know, does it look as horrible as Ori? You know, that's the metric. Is it Ori ugliness? Yeah, exactly. And and another big point on that is is we're we're not saying every game has to wow people, but if you want your game to be a commercial success and make money, it pretty much has to wow people. Yeah. Because that's kind of where we're at on Steam right now. Is if you don't wow people, if mm-hmm. you don't have that amazing wow factor to get them both, you know, with the aesthetics to get them to buy the game and the, give it a try to the first place, and then you know, and then that wow factor to keep them playing and prevent them from refunding, mm-hmm. then you're you're not going to get very far. And and it. It's really sad that it's yeah. kind of come to that, but that's that's where it is. I mean, basically, you have to front load your games. That does not mean that do not put anything after the front loading. It doesn't <laughs> mean just purely front load your game, but you you have to pretty much have to front load your game. And triple A's do that very very hard, and then they often put nothing after that. Mm-hmm. But they can get away with that because they're triple A's kind of yeah. thing. Indies. Indies will get chastised, run out of there really, really hard if you try doing that kind of thing. Do not do that thing. Yeah. Definitely front load it, but don't yeah. make the front load the only load. You need a front mm-hmm. load, you need an end load, you need <laughs> several loads load. in between. Mm-hmm. You need all the loads. And again, like we've said before, if your, mar- if your strategy for making your indie game is just be like Blizzard, you're going to fail. Yeah, unless you're Blizzard. Yeah. Which then you wouldn't be indie. So Yeah. We we've just entered a paradox. Wait, Blizzard's not an indie developer? No, no. Really? They they have the triple A triple A <laughs> moniker. Mm-hmm. And like to give you an example, when we looked at that game Fae Tactics, when it comes to the aesthetic standpoint, again, does it have unreal four K graphics? No. But when you look at the cutscenes or you look at the screenshots of it, it does, you know, pop out to you. Like, you can tell that a lot of work was done to the aesthetics of that game. Yeah, and it, it, when we say graphical aesthetics, we don't mean the graphical horsepower. Like he said, the, the, the 4K, you know, eight Super HD or anything like that. Hmm. It can be pixel art. It, it can be just 2D. It can be many things. It can be 3D. It can be many things. Mm-hmm. But it has to wow. And yep. I would say it's almost harder to wow in 3D, which is the reason why I think a lot of 3D developers really zoom out the camera <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to get the wow because, you know, while their undetailed stuff looks, you know, really really bad close up when you zoom out like you know 20 30 feet kind of thing looks pretty decent you know it's one of those it's like a car you know (laughs) from 15 feet away the thing looks like a flawless you know Mm -hmm. masterpiece kind of thing you get right up on it and you see like these big chunks of paint missing you know different colors flashed in here you know rust and everything else and you're like oh this is horrible <laughs> I did play a Blackthorn. I never beat it. I remember them from. I can go back further to the Lost Vikings from Blizzard, <laughs> or Rock and Roll Racing. <laughs> and then that's one of the reasons why when a lot of any developers will focus on two D because it is easier work in two D than it is in three D. It's also far uh, less expensive to do good 2D compared to good 3D. 
Like I don't uh, know. That's that's debatable. Well, when we there was an interview with uh, they were talking about with Naughty Dial how much money they spent on making the characters breathing animations to look realistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. The reason why it's debatable is because there is so many things that you can go into. Like, like if you do two D and everything is frame by frame, oh man, that is about as expensive as you can get. If you're there trying is, to do like Cuphead or you know, like Vanillaware with their two D art, yeah, like Cuphead had to be pretty dang expensive. Mm -hmm. That I think was but, all done hand drawn, you know, one frame at a time animation. Mm hmm. And I'm sure there's other game, other two games that are more expensive than that. I mean, like, and I think Cuphead, you know, I, I think Cuphead's art was probably more expensive than most th 3D art. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure that was, you know, which means they either had a large, large budget on that game, or the main developer was the, the artist. So he didn't have to charge obscene amounts for his services for his own game. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and again, like we said, like from an art standpoint, you need your game. It's not about looking super realistic. Because again, no one in developer is going to compete with Blizzard or Naughty Dog or, you know, Rockstar games in terms of making their characters look or making their world look realistic. But you have to give the player something that looks, you know, uniquely yours. Like, someone should be able to look at your game and go, yes, this is exactly this game. Like, I will never confuse it with anything else. Cuphead is an obvious example. Darkest Dungeon as well really work as work like that too. That, yeah, that you know, really ugly game card, Ori, that one yeah. did that too. Mm hmm You know, Ori with its, you know, just horrible looking graphics. Like how, who could play that game? I don't know. Only masochists, right? Pretty much. <laughs> well, that's perfect <laughs> for me then. It's a game for Josh. Yeah. And again, you and we're joking about this, but there are people who consider, you know, standard for your game to look like something like Ori or like a Blizzard or a Nintendo game and that's their baseline like they don't want anything that looks worse than that yeah and there's a lot of people like that yeah like I told you like I was watching a review somebody wrote about Curse of the Moon 2 and they said I don't like indie games because they all just look like Donkey Kong or Mario and when I heard that my my, my uh, soul left my body for a minute yeah I mean, they, they, they haven't seen a uh, uh, what you would call it a game. Um, um, I'm blanking on the studio's name. The one that makes the the very grindy, very you know basic lazy bear. Yeah, lazy bear. Mm -hmm. But you know, beautiful art. Yeah. Or you know, all the crazy games that we've played over the last four or five years. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I, I find it amazing that some developers decide to blind themselves so much to where they're like, oh, I don't, you know, like, like games with bad graphics are fine. You know, Minecraft's a CD. It's like Minecraft, number one, released in a completely different market. Like, like, mm -hmm. like what was it, 10, 10 years ago almost? I think it was like the well, first version, like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. It it, it launched before Steam existed. Mm -hmm. You know what it took to sell a game back then, what it took to sell a game five years ago or ten years ago, what it took to sell one five years ago, one what year it took ago. to sell it one year ago, and what it takes to sell a game today are completely different. Yeah. If you look at something like uh, Jeff Vogue with his games, that he has a dedicated fan base. There is no doubt about this. Yeah, I think you may be right. The original version of Steam was 2004. But it? if you look at something like Jeff Vogue's games, they have 
very basic art to them. They're one of the areas where a lot of people have criticized him for. But mm -hmm. he knows to keep he knows what his market is. And again, that is certainly fair. But I would also argue that if somebody made a you know a very complicated, very in-depth RPG like Gene Forge or um I'm I'm playing on the rest of his games, but they had a unique aesthetic to them. It would help the sales, and oh, one, yeah. one of the reasons why I know this is true would be something like Dungeons of Dreadmore that I'm talking about in my roguelike book. One of the reasons why Dungeons of Dreadmore succeeded or got a lot more notoriety as a roguelike for its time was that it wasn't ASCII graphics. It had its own you know animated cartoon like aesthetic to it. And again, this kind of stuff brings people in. Oh yeah, it's a hard game. It's still your classical roguelike. But that coat of paint on it did a lot to elevate above everybody else. And this yeah. is one of the things that we talk about. If you look at two, let's say you look at two platformers on Steam. One of them is very basic pixel art. I'm talking, you know... 1985, maybe 1984 graphics, and then another one looks like Ori. Which one do you think people are going to tune to first? I think they're going to tune to the uh, the worst looking one mm -hmm. because uh, I'm biased because I have a worst looking game and I want to put myself in a fantasy world to where oh, yeah. I believe my game is going to succeed without doing anything extra. Mm hmm. But wait, if we're talking about the worst looking one, wouldn't that still be Ori? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> and like, Well, then the better looking one, you know, the better <laughs> looking one. Yeah. And I do want to talk more about gameplay, so this is my last point about from the art point of view. That, again, this is why for a lot of developers that you have to look at the overall aesthetic of your game. And it it sucks. Like like Shark said, in the perfect world, people would be gameplay first, aesthetic second. And unfortunately, that's not the case. If somebody spends 10 seconds looking at your game or looking at a trailer and go, this is ugly or I don't like this look, guess what? All the hours and months and how much money you just spent on your game get thrown in the trash can. Yep. One thing I do have a theory of is if you want to go more towards gameplay first, I mean, a good demo might help bridge the gap. Or pro but, Yeah. But that said, is still, even at that, nobody's going to download your demo or prologue Mm -hmm. If there isn't at least somewhat good graphics, somewhat good aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And that's a sad because, you know, people won't even take a free demo kind of thing. And, and I know that went all too well because I don't take a lot of free demos myself or free games mm -hmm. that were already on there. Yeah, uh, graphics does sell games, but... Your graphics and trailers sell games. Yeah. But it's the gameplay that keeps them from refunding. Mm -hmm. And like we've said, you can't get away with free anymore. And that's the scary part for a lot of developers. Mm -hmm. Or cheap. Yep. You can say... I'm going to make my game very horrible looking. I'll sell it for a dollar and people will buy it. No. Because even a dollar, even free, is too much if your game doesn't look like it's going to be a great time. Well, there is a certain demographic that will get it per dollar. The game collectors. But if you're making a game for game collectors, then you're not making a game. Yeah. You're making a title screen. Mm-hmm. There you go. That's, Just make a title it. screen and sell it. <laughs> For a dollar. That, that's, that's you know, and you'll get, I don't know, 50, 100 people to game collectors to buy it. 
Yeah. Ironically, more than my last game. Well, not technically more, because I did get them at the end. Because, you know, I announced that the game was being removed from Steam, and they, they came in because they was like, oh, this is my last time to get this game. Mm-hmm. But unless you're removing your game from Steam, you're not going to get more than that. You will be, you know, because we only had 27 up to that point, and then we hit 127 after that, after removing it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you could literally sell better without removing your game for a dollar with just a title screen. Mm-hmm. And again- achievements had had you had the title screen up for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, eight minutes, you know. Mm-hmm. And there you go. <laughs> and, You're still not going to make any money, though. Yeah. And yeah. like to segue into talking about gameplay, I won't bring up Where the Water Tastes Like Wine again. Because this is one of those games that if you follow like people who are like love like art or storytelling about video games, my voice is really dying today. <clears throat> if you follow those people... They will shout the praises of Where the War Tastes Like Wine. You know, it's an emotionally gripping game. I love this title. It's so amazing. And then you look at the drop-off of the achievements and you see a different story. Less than 63% of the people who play the game made it past the first five minutes of playing this game. And that's not hyperbole. Because the first character you meet, the hobo kid, that's one that kind of shows off like almost immediately when you start playing the game. Again, 63% of the people got that. 40 or 37% of the people never even made it past their conversation with Sting. Hmm. And then the drop-off just keeps going down and down and down. And like we've said, this is why part of this discussion about retention has to do with the gameplay and the moment to moment. Because while aesthetics will get people's foot in the door, it's not going to keep them. And yeah. like with something like with Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, again, we played this game, and within 10 minutes of, or I'm sorry, less than that, within five minutes of playing the game, we were already like, oh my god, what is this game? Like, you know, the downward spiral of why should I play this game just immediately took hold. Yeah. And to Uter's point is um, that niche is going to go away very soon. Yeah. (laughs) Because, number one, multiplayer games are very hard to make. And (laughs) they're not not cheap. And if you make them with... with, uh, a you know very bad aesthetics, they're not going to do. They're not going to hold the players for very long. Yeah. Meaning that the game will go, you know, will lose its player base really quickly, and then there won't be any play, players to play that multiplayer with. So mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's still going to have that same. It's going to maybe even be more abrupt kind of thing doing it that way. Yeah. You have to have aesthetics like, like just shape, um, not just shapes and beats. Uh, Beat Saber mm-hmm. has tons of aesthetics. Yeah, it's very, very basic, very clean art style. I mean, it's nothing but like blocks and 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 little notes and stuff, and you know, and little grids and lines and here, there, and there, and it's very, very minimalistic, but it's got good mm-hmm. aesthetics. Remember that good aesthetics is not graphical horsepower. Good aesthetics means that it looks good. It has that wow factor. And, you know, Beat Saber wows the heck out of people. And it it was very minimalistic on its graphics, but it had that good aesthetics. And if you have bad aesthetics, it doesn't matter if you spend $10 million on them. It's bad aesthetics. You know? If you have good aesthetics, it doesn't matter if you paid five dollars for them, spent five minutes on them, you know, mm-hmm. or you know, spent a million dollars on them. You have good aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Yep. And 
to bring this back to the gameplay, again, onboarding and playability, this is why we say how it's important you have to really go over the opening of your game. And again, the opening of your game we're talking about from an onboarding, from a playability standpoint, from a UI and UX point of view. And this mm -hmm. is one area where a lot of indie developers tend to struggle with because this is playtesting. And as I'm sure Shark is well aware of, it can be very hard to find a huge pool of playtesters. No, it's easy. You know, you can just put out messages out there and tell everybody on every Discord channel to that you you know, come and play a free game, you know, it looks cool, you know, come and play it. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, that, that works perfectly fine. You don't ever end up getting, you know, asking a few thousand people and only get like two or three people come. You know, mm. that's that's not a reality. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But maybe mm -hmm. it is. Maybe it, it is a reality. Maybe you would do put out, you know, thousands and thousands of, you know, these messages and ask for people to come play test and, you know, pretty much nobody shows up. Because a free game, especially a free broken game, is not appealing to most people. No matter how interested they are in your game, too. Because, like, I've, I've had people that are like, wow, I really want to play that game. You know, referring to the one that I'm current doing now, making now, for a triad. And, the, and then I ask them, well, you know, would you be interested in playing it early? Because, you know, maybe in a month or two, I might have something playable kind of thing for mm -hmm. testing. And they're like, no, no, I'll, I'll wait till it's done. <laughs> and you would not believe how many your replies I get like that, even out of people who are directly interested in the game. Mm -hmm. More or less, you know, people who aren't interested, you know, that didn't, you know, directly interest in the game, you know. They just, you know, they're just straight out, nope, you know, and, or just ignore it kind of thing. And like, like, you will go through thousands and thousands of people asking publicly, and you will get very few yeses. And out of those very few yeses, very few of those are actually going to be people that are capable kind of thing. Because most of those yeses are just going to be people who sit down, play your game. Say not a dang word. Not a dang word. You know, they don't say they like it. They don't say they don't like it. They don't say anything. They they just go about their day. Or if they even played it, you know, because <laughs> you don't even know. You don't know if they played it or not. Not unless you have player statistics in there that show that they logged into the game at this time, at this place, you know, and played for five, ten minutes or whatever. You don't know that unless you're recording data on that testing. You know, mm -hmm. they could have played it for 100 hours. They could have played it for never booted it kind of thing. And you don't know because they didn't say anything. And you don't have more than likely statistics hooked up to your test versions. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like you just said, even those people like who do play your game, they may not give you any feedback whatsoever. And this is that problem when it comes to the UI and UX point of view. Because either you already know how you do all that stuff, and you know you build it into your game, or you don't, and you may never know why somebody plays or doesn't play your game. This is why when I uh, spoke with uh, John Brieger, like when he does his playtesting sessions, he explicitly says, I want you to record yourself playing this game. Because that feedback can be worth its weight in gold to a new developer. Yeah, the video the video feedback is so much better. I mean, they don't even have to say anything, mm -hmm. really. Especially if they have a face cam on at the same time. Yep. Like, just watch your reactions. If they say anything, you know, like, damn it, you know, <laughs> at a certain moment or whatever, you know, or like, oh, you know, like, just listening to the sound effects kind of thing of them just does so much. But seeing their reactions, seeing a face cam of them, it does so much more. But, but just... And you don't even need the sound effects or the face cam to get a lot out of it. Because if you just watch the gameplay and you see them 
go and click on this thing figure out you know and then leave it not figuring out that they're supposed to click here in this mm -hmm. and then you see them go back and click on that thing and then they go back they leave they go back and click on the thing they leave they go back and click on the thing and they're just stuck there not mm -hmm. figuring out that they need to click the next thing you know that you've got a problem with communicating something there with clicking on that next thing and yeah. you know just that alone is so valuable but mm -hmm. you know you don't you don't even need that you know but that would be very beneficial you know I would see if you can get that you get get what you can is mm -hmm. my point if you can just you know get the minimum of people play it and they say well I really like this part this part glitched out on me and this part you know mm -hmm. like I think it would be cool if you added this that is also worth its weight and go kind of thing. Yeah. But you can't, unfortunately, rely on every one of your testers explicitly spelling out why something worked or something didn't work for you. Oh, yeah. It's very much like you have to be like a doctor kind of mm -hmm. thing. You are the game design doctor. And this needs to be apparently a YouTube series or something. The game design doctor. Mm -hmm. To where, you know, they're going to tell you, you know, something. And that's something is related to the issue, but probably won't be the issue. Like, hey, I would, you know, why don't you put, you know, better jump mechanics in there? You know, put put a triple jump in there or whatever. And you you look at it and you're like, why would I put a triple jump in there? And you you look at their, you know, you got to examine it, and it's very much like a doctor. You go into a doctor and say. Hey, I think I got, you know, cancer kind of thing. The doctor's like, why do you think you have cancer? You know, why do you want this triple jump? You know, kind of thing. And then they say, well, because my stomach hurts right here. <laughs> and, you know, it's because I can't. Hold on one second. I think we may have lost connection again. What's uh -oh. going on with, I can't tell if this is a OBS or a YouTube issue. All right, I think we're back. Mm, All right, that's weird. Okay, so when when so you go in there with the you look as a game design doctor, you look at their stomach ache and you you figure out, hey, you haven't went to the bathroom in like two weeks. Maybe it might be beneficial to go. <laughs> yeah, and you know it's like, hey, you know, you're not supposed to go to that platform. You're supposed to go to this other platform. Maybe you should look at that. So. If, if they're not seeing that platform and they're seeing this platform, maybe you might want to put a wall there to say, hey, don't go this way. Yep, and, and, then, and then you'll maybe highlight that platform, make it more visual somehow, you know, mm -hmm. whether you put something on there that glows, whether you, you change the color of it, whether you do any number of things to make things better. And here's like this, here's the part, like, and this is why developers cannot, there's no excuses anymore. This kind of onboarding and making things easier to process has found its way to Kaizo games. Many modern or many of the contemporary Kaizo developers now will use coin trails similar to Mario Maker to indicate whether or not you need a spin jump or a regular jump. Before, you just had to do a guess. And again, you had a 50-50 chance of dying on your first time when you get to a section. Now the game will actually say, okay, if it uses blue coins, that means you should spin jump on this point. Mm-hmm. Yep, and, and yep. As, as, as we all know, that, you know, if a Kaizo has, has any kind of onboarding, it's not a Kaizo game anymore. <laughs> and again, like, this is where this argument comes in about feedback. Because like we've said before, you have to take all feedback. And then, as Shark said, you have to be able to kind of work through the prognosis of it. Somebody who tells you your game is horrible, it's hard to play, you have to listen to that and figure out why do they say that. And mm -hmm. if you just listen everyone says, oh, your game's perfect, you run into something like Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, where, yes, I'm sure there are people who think that game is perfect, and they probably played it for 10 minutes and then never played it again. Mm -hmm. And 
to your point, uh, like you don't need to listen to that entire comment. Mm -hmm. You can drop the "it's horrible," just forget about that part, and 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 concentrate, focus on the part where it's too hard, mm -hmm. kind of thing, and drop the it. Yo, you can forget about the "it's horrible." You don't need to focus on that, but you do need to focus on the "it's too hard." You know, yes. as as analogy that we've had, you know is is a lot of comments can be poop the YouTube safe word hopefully mm -hmm. but there are nuggets of gold in a lot of that poop so you know discard the poop look for the the gold nuggets and use those to help improve your game mm -hmm. and then as you do that less and less poop will come your way. Yeah. <laughs> like, here's an example. Here's another one that I saw from the Kaizo game. One thing that they introduced is this idea of you can switch uh, Mario's jump type while he's in the air. So if he, you start as a regular jump, you hit a button, he goes into spin jump, or vice versa. And one of the early versions of this made it so that you could only do it by pressing L on the SNES controller. And the problem with it is that it can be very hard. You're doing multiple commands to hit that button at the right time. So what they did very simply was say, okay, L or R, either one, you can use it to do this specific mechanic. And it improved the onboarding of that. And the only way they figured that out was that streamers and YouTubers who are playing this hack were finding it very janky to do that kind of command. And that's what they were complaining. They said it felt jank. And mm -hmm. the modder and or the modder or hacker, however you want to call it, he made that change and made it a lot better. Yeah, and to Rat's tail point, uh, it applies to basically all games. Mm -hmm. Like physical games they have the advantage of once they're sold, you can't refund them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, you could do kind of whatever you want and get away with it to point it with that, but don't expect any sales on your second game if you do that kind of thing. And short games, I mean, short games can't be too short or else you're going to have people using the Steam two-hour refund policy against you to where they play and beat your game in 20 minutes and then they're like well I'm not paying two dollars for this game mm -hmm. refund you know I'm not playing five dollars ten dollars eighty dollars however much you're paying for the game for that game because it's so short yeah. you know I think the I think the shortest game that you can possibly get away with on releasing on Steam is an hour and a lot of people are going to be unhappy with that hour unless you can somehow stretch it out, <laughs> which makes it not an hour. Yeah. Like, like, like the Binding of Isaac. The Binding of Isaac is what, 20, 30 minutes long? Yeah, but it's a road wide. Yeah. So that there's multiple playthroughs so that you get, you know, and there's variance in those playthroughs encouraging that one playthrough is not the game. One playthrough is just one one millionth of the game. Have fun trying to get all the millions kind of thing. Yeah. And that's that's one way to make a short game longer. You know, of course, you know, you need... There's ways to do this, and that's one of them. You know, I mean, like, if you look at my last game, my last game, when I released it, it was roughly 20 hours. But when I looked at it, I was like... Okay, we have 15 different maps to play. That is it. Mm -hmm. And each map takes 5 to 10 minutes to play, so that's not a very long game. But through using New Game Plus, through adding new mechanics and everything, through level scaling and all these different things, and a story arc that gives you a reason why you would backtrack through 10 of the maps and create variants on those maps because those maps, they're the same maps but they're completely different situations because the enemy has changed 
because your your original your vision of the game was not actually the true vision according to the story kind of thing and you're making that realize of that big plot twist and you're like oh crap I need to go over there and replay those 10 levels back to there so it ended up being 25 stages but only 15 maps while you know and then that you know and then I was able to bring that into a 20 hour experience and then it was like if you go for 100% it's like 50 hours kind of thing like there there are ways and methods to extend it and not extend it through filler or through grind or through anything else I mean there's a little bit there's grind of course in there because it's a tactical RPG you know people would ride if there wasn't some grind in there and it, but it's very minimum. But there, there's ways and methods of game design to give players a meaningful experience while extending less content. I mean, like if you look at my current game, I mean the the gameplay loop is like five minutes. When you say about five minutes to play a game of Project Red, yeah. And again, like the core gameplay loop of a title is always going to be on the short side. There's no such thing as a five hour core gameplay loop. Mm -hmm. But it's about making that core gameplay very interesting. It's about making it something that people want to keep playing. And, like, again, to Rat's Hill point about Binding of Isaac, it is technically, it's a short playthrough, but it's meant to be replayed. Again, that is the nature of roguelike design. You can't make every game like a roguelike, unfortunately. That would be mm -hmm. great for me. But, again, something like the Binding of Isaac... The basic gameplay, or the core gameplay, is like two to three minutes of actual gameplay. You walk around, you shoot your tears, you fight a boss. But it's engaging. It keeps people wanting to play. And that's where this kind of sprints of play come in. That... <laughs> oh, we're going to have to have that argument there, Ryu? <laughs> mm -hmm. But, again, it's this idea that it's five, ten minutes of gameplay... That you want to keep doing again and again and again. And you can say this about any high profile or very, really great game. Dark Souls, what's the core gameplay of that? You walk around, you drink your assets, you fight enemies. It's what, three minutes of gameplay? But it is high stakes, very challenging three minutes of gameplay that you're going to repeat for how many hours that you want to play. And, and it's a question on how much of that repeating can you do safely mm -hmm. with the amount of assets that you have to get a long enough game to be sellable reasonably on Steam. Yeah, This is what, if you remember when we talked with Tim, or Tim Russwick, about his upcoming game, that he is trying to stretch out his mechanics as far as you can go. And I think we need to clarify when we talk about this. When we say stretch out or pad in this regard, this is not a way of manipulating the player, you know, saying, you know, this is an 80-hour long game, but it's really only five minutes. What we're saying is you can take a core gameplay, again, five, ten minutes, maybe 15 minutes, a 15-minute sprint of gameplay, and figure out all the ways that you can do something unique or different with it to add more content to it. Because if you it's don't do that, yep, and if you don't do that, then every video game ever made would be five minutes long. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's pretty much... Every game is, again, like five minutes long if you go like that. And mm -hmm. there, 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 there are pretty much none that actually are five minutes long. So you got to find a way to 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 take that short gameplay mm -hmm. and make it last long enough by providing enough variance there you go. and changes in 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 that thing. It's like, oh, I'm playing through this game. Oh, it's just you know strict numbers versus number. Oh, now I have this ability to poison mm -hmm. them, and now it you know takes their numbers down a little bit at a time. Now I have the power to burn them. It does the same thing, but a little bit differently, you know, because now it's, you know, now instead of just a slow, instead of like, you know, 
10 points every turn, it's, it's, it's like 20 points, and then it's 19, 18, 17, 16, until it gets down to zero kind of thing, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, Rat's Tale actually beat me to the next point that I wanted to say, that when we talk about this, it's like, as Shark says, about finding as many variations on a theme that you can. And one of the masters of this have have been Nintendo. The Mario games have a very basic core gameplay loop. You run and you jump. And what they do is they add in all these different elements with the obstacle challenges and the different ways of jumping to stretch that out into a huge variety of elements. Again, Mario, what you do in the first five minutes of a Mario game are going to be the same exact thing you do in the last five minutes. But that first, like, ten, five seconds, more yeah. like but it's all the ways that you can change that up. And again, when we say change, we're not saying design a brand new thing. We're saying introduce a new variation. Um, if you remember when we play uh, Ultimate Chicken Horse, it's that even that simple idea of putting honey down on a platform that completely changes the dynamic of that jump. And yeah, it's a, because you, with that honey there, like now when somebody lands on it, they're going to have a hard time jumping to the next platform. Yeah. You know, and they might jump too hard. They might jump not hard enough because of that honey manipulating them. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody took that honey and they attached a, a uh, rotating thing to it. So mm -hmm. now that platform rotates. Now, you know, they take and put a cannon to it. <laughs> now, now it, now when you land on that, now you're fired across the screen kind of thing. Now, when you land, you know when you land on that honey, you know. Now somebody's put a a gun on it, yeah. kind of thing, and and now it shoots. Now you take a rotating platform that we've already talked about. You put honey on it, and then you put the gun on it. And now you've got a rotating gun that yeah. fires in randomly in all directions, or or you can do a cannon on there instead of a gun that again randomly fires in many different directions. And here's an example of, like, to, to Rat's Tale point about game most of our little complexity. In Braid, there is this classic puzzle where the player starts on the left side, they have to get over to the right side, and there's usually a key, like, in a pit. And what uh, John Blow did was for each one of the time manipulating mechanics, he used that in that same puzzle. But because it's using a different mechanic, it feels like a different puzzle. You can't use the same solution when you have the shadow clone power that you did with the, you know, you move forward, time goes forward, you move backwards, time rewinds kind of mechanic. And that is a good example of, you know, getting the most value out of these mechanics. This is why there's always that risk when you, if you design something that can only be used in one specific way for one specific puzzle, you're not really getting all that much value out of it. But if you, like, to Shark's example, the honey and, you know, the utility of that, you get a lot of value out of what could be considered a very simple mechanic. And that's pretty much, like, Tim's specialty is, mm -hmm. like, he's not going to, you know, I mean, you don't have to do this as a developer, but this is what Tim does. You know, Tim will not use a mechanic that he cannot use at least three other times. Yep. Even if it's something super basic that he can put in in like three seconds he will oh, not wow. use it yeah kind of thing I, I'm not that way you know I will put in a mechanic that will see multiple uses but will not you know be doing multiple things it will only be doing one thing because it's it's important to have that one thing and it's used multiple times like a shop you know I'm only going to use a shop for a shop and mm -hmm. I want to put a shop in there so I can sell gear and equipment. And that is very important, very core to my loop and everything. And if, if you know, like, I wouldn't want to shop for anything else. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, do anything else with a shop. But I will put build a shop because it's core to the design. Yeah. And it's, it's really, you know, figuring out. You, you've got to do as much as you can, as cheap as you can, but you've got to also do stuff that is the most important for the game itself. So, you know, if there's something high work, 
only good for one thing, but it's absolutely critical for your game design. You need to put it in there. But yeah. if it's something high work, you may use it 10 times kind of thing, and you know it's not important at all, you probably don't want to put that in your game. You probably want to drop that off your game design document. Yeah, like if something, if, if it's only something you're going to use once and it's going to take you like five months of development to do, it's probably not worth your time. Yeah. And to the other point about from Rattail, repeated puzzles, no, you should never directly copy and paste content. And this is something I think a lot of puzzle designers tend to mess up on. That mm -hmm. tell me you have 10,000 puzzles in your game doesn't mean those are 10,000 original puzzles. It could be the it could be a puzzle could be okay, push block to the left, solve that puzzle. Now the very next puzzle, okay, now you're going to push that block to the right, and it's a brand new thing. No, it's not. Yeah, that's 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 a big no-no. You and we see platformer developers will fall into that trap as well. Okay, you're going to do a platform that goes left to right, and we're going to do that five times in the same level. And again, like this is one of those aspects where Kaizo developers are really good at this. A Kaizo yeah. level is typically two unique sections long and those two sections are going to do as many things they can with one or one specific mechanic or theme and then we move on to the other half yeah when we talk about kaizo people who make kaizos they're you know and i don't mean this in a insulting way it's going to sound it mm -hmm. they're less game designers and more level designers yeah. because the, they're they're normally just taking Mario and and editing it. You know they didn't make Mario. They didn't mm -hmm. make the core game. They're so they're not game developers, but they're they're completely deleting the levels and everything and using their mechanics in a unique way mm -hmm. and designing unique levels and everything. And I think there's you know some of the best level designers out there, but they're they're you know some of the best. You know, level designers out there for the masochist. Mm -hmm. Like again, and this is why we talk about with Kaizo design. It has a very limited market because of that. Now there are Kaizo developers who make original assets and make original mechanics, mm -hmm. and you know that is definitely you know, a step above your standard Kaizo game. Like but, Celeste. Yeah. Or, you know, something like Invictus, I think, had its own mechanics, and I think there's another really big one out now that did it as well. But, again, they're doing everything they can with a very limited pool of mechanics. And just as you can get too limited, you also want, don't want to throw everything you can at a player and, you know, make a platformer level that's like 15 different mechanics that you all have to master at once. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let me check our time. We have, like, I, th I say maybe like another 15, 20 minutes and I have to wrap things up. But I do want to move on to the final part, talking about retention when it comes to free-to-play or, you know, very limited gameplay loops like that. But do you have any final thoughts talking about uh, retention when it comes to mechanics? Not really, other than just the final closing up of, you know, you you need to figure out these mechanics and everything and figure out the way you're going to, you know, save yourself work and, you know, also commit towards the, you know, what's best for the game in your original game design document and get that stuff worked out in a, at least a basic sense before you start, generally. Hmm. Not always, but generally, you know, the sooner you get it, the better. As people say, you need to find the fun in your game as early as you can. Mm hmm So, uh, with that said, for the final part of our topic for today, from the thumbnail, I included a game like The Witcher 3, which is an 80, you know, 100-hour-plus experience easily. And again, challenges of onboarding and game mechanics to get somebody into that. But I also included the mobile game Dragon Ball Legends, because that would be the complete opposite of The Witcher, wherein this is a game that is designed, again, around 5-10 to 10 minute spurts of gameplay, 
and then trying to keep somebody invested for hours and days and months and years and so on. And when we talk about free to play and these kinds of designs, you have to approach things differently. Because a game like Dragon Ball Legends or, um, I don't know, Clash of Clans or any one of those other mobile type games, you're not designing a gameplay loop or experience that is meant to be over 50 to 100 hours long. They are designed, again, around 3 minutes, maybe 10 minutes at most at a time, and it takes a different mindset and design to keep people coming back with that. Yeah, we're going Super Saiyan with this conversation. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. You know, a lot of mobile design is, you know, meant to be in five minute chunks because it's just like I'm out and about. Mm -hmm. You know, I got five minutes to kill. Wait, who's out and about now? Yeah. <laughs> is, is Corona the death of mobile? <laughs> Who knows? Anyway. <laughs> you're out and about, you got five minutes while you're waiting in a waiting room with a lot of pe infected people around you, you know, giving you the corona, and you like, well, I'm, I'm about to die from corona, let's go ahead and kill five minutes while I'm <laughs> sitting here dying from corona, and, and play a game here for five minutes. <laughs> and and you play for five minutes, you get called back to your appointment, they tell you you got corona, you leave, and you infect other people while you're, you're playing another five minutes of the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh and yeah like and yeah like Downwell that's a good example of a game again and that goes into the more roguelike roguelite kind of atmosphere of you know being a very repetitive sprint or very repetitive or very repeatable I should say in terms of its design loop now when we talk about things from a free to play or mobile standpoint and even like multiplayer games, I think, also fit into this category. That oh, yeah. you are playing a game for... The gameplay loop is fixed, especially in a multiplayer-based game. If it's a 20-minute match, it's a 20-minute match. You know, you're not going to go... It won't turn into a three-hour game. And the challenge of the developer is to figure out, okay... How do I keep somebody coming back for these 20 minute plays? And again, you don't have the same luxuries of storytelling and long term gameplay as we see with some of the other titles we mentioned today. Boy, you could, but you usually don't. Yeah. So this I mean, is. That, yeah, that's ahead. what I got in my current game, you know, because my current game is a multiplayer only game. Mm -hmm. At least at the. You know, at the time of launch, whenever we get to that point, <laughs> it'll be multiplayer only. It does have a very big focus on story, though. And, like, the main gameplay loop, the main game is five minutes long, you know, roughly. Mm -hmm. You you go and play a match of cards, you know, to this very unique card game, tactical card game, I think would be a better term for it. Um, it's a grid based tactical card game. It's not a tactical RPG by any means, because you're not moving any units, you're just placing them down on the grid and then, you know, kind of thing. You're not placing them down and then moving. But your your experience in this five minutes of gameplay through you know, multiplayer, and each turn has a time limit and everything, and you're going to play through a certain amount, and then you're going to exit out. Then you're going to go to the main thing, and you know, or back to the main menu kind of thing. And, you know, to you know how we're getting our story in there is we're putting story in there story bits in there while you're waiting on matchmaking so you're 45 seconds of matchmaking or whatever it's going to be um maybe 30 seconds of that will be a cutscene. You, you'll you'll see the matchmaking thing and you'll see a cutscene kind of thing and you'll get the story and everything and you know and then the last but uh, 15 seconds or so, you'll just be waiting on the 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 the, the matchmaking. Other aspects is like, you know, the initial uh, like tutorial. The way we're going to onboard people is we're going to have them play games, but we're also going to have a heavy story in there, but not like too too heavy. You know, it's certainly going to be probably a lot longer than 30 seconds, but 
we want to grasp people onto the world and you know at the same time teaching them through the tutorial in a streamlined way that they don't realize that they're going through tutorial they think that this is just the mm -hmm. campaign mode or whatever <laughs> but it's it's not the campaign mode it is the tutorial and that's the reason why you have to start with it before you can play any multiplayer game because you have to be onboarded before you get into the main game but you know we're going to try to keep that tutorial slash campaign mode very very as short as possible kind of thing like we don't want to you know have you play that for like three hours before you get into a real game kind of thing you know you know maybe you know probably something like 10 to 20 minutes probably is probably around what I'm shooting for kind of thing mm -hmm. but we'll have to see you know because we have a good bit of stuff to teach so it's going to take time to teach that mm -hmm. and the other aspect of the game is that you know to you know I think a lot of people on multiplayer games don't want to keep on playing because they they get fatigued you know they'll they'll play a match and then they'll play another match and then they'll play another match and then they'll play another match and they'll be like ah do I really want to play another match mm -hmm. there, there's nothing to break up that that it becomes tedious because you're always doing the same thing and I noticed this on my last game when I was going through the maps and everything before we had added the little mini game, the rock paper scissors mini game in there, mm -hmm. because it just felt tedious kind of thing after a certain point. And I have a feeling they'll feel the same way about the card game, which is the reason why I think the real strength of this of a multiplayer game is the socialization. Mm -hmm. You know, not just playing against other players. But getting to talk to them, getting to team up, getting to play together, you know, have alliances or guilds or whatever, get to, you know, team up and, you know, try to do the best thing you can together and try to, you know, talk to them and get strategies and come up with strategies and just overall socialize. And you do this, you can do this at any point, but, you know, specifically you do that in the points between your matches kind of thing you know maybe not between every match but you know you may want to do three or four matches in a row stop and then socialize a little bit do another two or three matches stop and socialize mm -hmm. do another couple of matches you know whatever order benefits you best but it breaks up that gameplay loop mm -hmm. with another interactive activity that's interesting and keeps you going kind of thing and is done that way to retain players and also, another thing you see on like card games specifically is you see like these quests. Like you get like X amount of quests a day, and you see people that you know that will go through these quests to get the free currency kind of thing, and or you know, or get whatever currency. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they finish that second, the last quest, they quit. You know, end of that. But you know that's because they're more addicted to the game rather than, you know, they want to play it. If they wanted to play it, they would keep on playing after that point. And you have to give them reasons to, to want to play. You have to give a reason to retain their playership, not just a quest. Mm -hmm. You know, quests help, but they only help for a certain point. And another thing I'm doing to extend that is basically there's infinite quests, but after a certain point, their mystery quest because I don't want players to get too addicted to the game that they play to a point to where they you know just play you know in order to get all the quests which they're infinite so at a certain point we'll cut the quest off and be like that was your last mystery quest you know at the time we determined that, you know, basically the player probably should take a break at this point, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And prevent the addictive behavior. We want them to play and enjoy the game. We want to retain the players, but we don't want to retain the players to the point of hurting their well-being. Yeah. You know. And that's something that we spoke with Ramin about many times. And how... Like, mobile games, and specifically these kinds of free-to-play games, they're really great at onboarding players. You know, like, the first 
20 minutes to an hour playing these games are really solid in terms of onboarding. But it's very easy to go overboard in terms of, you know, player retention in that regard, and it becomes harmful. You know, if somebody is forced to play your game for an hour and a half every day, or they'll be punished or they'll lose progress, you know, there are going to be people who are going to do that, and it's going to end up hurting them in the long run. Mm hmm. And that's another thing is like our quest uh, roll over for several days. Mm hmm. Um, I haven't worked out a Exactly. But what I'm thinking about right now is that they'll roll over infinitely, but only X number of them will roll over infinitely. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, that X number may be like, I don't know, eight, let's say, for example, and you get two a day. So you can play once every four days and get all eight of them and never lose any of them. Mm -hmm. Or maybe maybe there'll be like fourteen that roll over. I I don't know. You know that's still in development. But I want to make it where they don't have to log in every single day. Yeah. And again, like when we talk about like, and that's short term retention. Now another major part about this is the long term, and this is where it gets very tricky for these kinds of games. Again, the advantages of a traditional video game is that. The long-term play is that you enjoy the core gameplay loop, it's growing, it's changing, and you're going to be invested to play through that game all the way through the end. Or the story is growing and changing, and you're going to do that. From a roguelike perspective, again, the core game loop is very engaging, it is replayable, and I'm going to keep replaying, you know, 30, 40 minute long playthroughs, you know, for the next 100 hours, like I've been doing with Monster Train or Slay the Spire. For... Mm -hmm. A mobile game, the core gameplay loop is not necessarily changing. You're not going to introduce brand new systems in these kinds of games. Instead, it becomes that chase of power. Or, to Shark's point earlier, the social interaction. You know, who's the best player on the server? Who's going to take home, you know, the top prize this season? Competition. And, yep. And in this aspect, you have to think about your game in terms of, you know, how long can we keep pumping content into this? When you look at a lot of mobile-based games, especially those that are character-oriented, they will typically add in a brand new character, what, like maybe every two weeks, every month, maybe even less than that. And because, usually run an event on it. Oh, yes. And then that event will have an exclusive banner. And that banner will have a limited time. Mm -hmm. And, like, again, like, with the uh, thumbnail, the Dragon Ball Legends game, I think they're having their five-year anniversary, the other Dragon Ball game, Dragon Ball Boken, I think that's what it's called, which, incidentally, they're both published by Bandai Namco, so they are, like, super double-dipping on the uh, free-to-play Dragon Ball games there. And, yeah, they're having these, uh, they have, like, new characters added in, and they have limited-time rewards, they have the special exclusive events, and, yeah, that, that gets into abusive territory. Oh, yes. But, again, it's abusive, but it works. And, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's how we kind of describe a lot of the games in this category. That you have to figure out a way to keep people playing when your game may only be, you know, again, like 20 to 30 minute long experience. Or one minute in the case mm -hmm. of Mario. Yeah. And in this yeah. aspect, their way of doing that is to pad out the progression. And again, mm -hmm. when we talk about numbers, there is an infinite amount of numbers. You can keep adding things until the cows come home. But eventually what's going to end up happening in this case is that either A, the player base will wise up and say, oh, you've just added in nine star characters. You know, let me guess, you're going to add in ten star in a month from now, and they're going to stop playing? Or mm -hmm. your game will be reduced down to nothing but the whales. You know, the 5% of the people who are going to play your game, and nobody else will want to play because the buy-in will be, you know, I need to spend $200, or I'm just going to be beaten by everybody else. Yeah. And the issue you run into that is when you mistreat your free players and everything and they they all quit on you and you end up with only wells and dolphins kind of thing, then wells then wells dolphins become 
you know, the prey instead of the the, the free players, mm -hmm. and then they all quit because their their gameplay experience was you know you know ruined, and then and then you have the whales that prey on the other whales until you know the whale population starts to dwindle until you've got nobody playing mm -hmm. except for one person, the biggest whale basically, or the most committed whale. And that 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 that's that's the end of your game. Well, the end of your game was probably you know the second you lost all your free players, or ninety percent of them. But you 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 have to be fair to your free players in order to retain them. You know, don't don't mistreat them. You you've got yeah. to treat them well, and that's one thing I'm working on very intently on my game. It's not technically a mobile game. But there might be a mobile port. There's a plan of mobile port as well as a plan of a VR port. Mm -hmm. But it's primarily a, a PC game. But the the um, you know you treat we're we're working we're treating our customers well. We're mm -hmm. developing a brand new consumer friendly model, and again, it's a tactical card game. So mm -hmm. the key is tactics. You're not going not, to win by spending money. Yeah, you're not going to win by spending money. You'll have a better chance at winning, but you're you know that is very very limited kind of thing because basically what spending money does is it unlocks new cards that unlock new tactics for you to do. So of course, if you're tactical, mm -hmm. the more tactical options you have the better you can do so it mm -hmm. does benefit to own more cards because the more cards you own the better you're going to do obviously but mm -hmm. if you come in with no tactics and you own all the cards you're gonna lose you're, you're and you take a you know somebody who's professional kind of thing and they come in with just a mm -hmm. basic starter deck they're gonna wipe the floor with you mm -hmm. they're gonna completely wipe the floor with you it, it, there's an analogy that I like to use with this. Like when I, when we talk about like people who buy gear, who play a sport, you know, golf clubs, tennis rackets, anything like that. That mm -hmm. if somebody buys the best golf club on the planet, but can't swing it for, to save their life, somebody using you know like a ten or tw I don't know how much <laughs> golf clubs are, but like a twenty dollars set, let's just say, could a probably wipe the floor. They pull it out of a dumpster. Yeah. And yet, now to reuse point about things are online. Yep, that's a good point. Now the cynic in me says that probably less people are spending money in that game compared to something like Clash of Clans or any kind of gotcha based design. Which again, that's unfortunately, you know, the the cynical part when we have this conversation about retention. That the games that retain the players the most are oftentimes the most exploitive because those are the practices that work the best. Yeah, the exploitive practices are exploiting the retention. They're they're mm -hmm. manipulating you psychologically to mm -hmm. to get you to keep on playing. And that is something I'm trying to avoid as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Of course, that said, is I don't think you can ever hundred percent avoid that kind of stuff. Yeah. You can you know, like like Every game out there, I think, has that psychological hook that will, you know, that manipulates you psychologically. Like a game with a really good story, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You you go through that, and you get to that first moment where it just pulls the heck out of your heartstrings. You're mm -hmm. manipulated psychologically from that point forward to find out what happens next. Yeah, and this is again that when we when I had that conversation with Ramin about addiction when it comes to games, that great games are addictive because they're great games. They're, if the game wasn't a great, you weren't going to play to begin with. The, the point, though, that is important to break down is that when games become exploitive, when they demand yeah. that you play them, Again, the whole civilization one more turn would have taken on a different connotation if the game said that if you don't do 20 turns a day, you will lose, you know, your civ will start running out money, kind of thing. Yeah. You'll, you'll lose some of the playing classes. 
Mm -hmm. and yeah, that would be abusive yeah. right there. And that's where that line falls in. Again, I, this will be kind of my final point because I have to get going in the next five, ten minutes. But this whole conversation about retention, that ultimately your game needs to be good. And that's what we're trying to get at, that great games will retain players. As we said at the very start, when it comes to aesthetics, the aesthetics of a game is the foot in the door. The gameplay is what's going to keep them coming back. This is why games like East Shade, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, and other kind of artistically or kind of more or less gameplay focused titles, they'll have a lot of people who will play them and they will stop within 40 minutes of play. Or in most cases, they'll return that game. Yeah. Artistic, you know, like, we, the better your aesthetics are, it better aesthetics does help with retention, but it, it's not it's not a big factor in retention. Mm -hmm. But, like, the, the more wow it is, the more it will affect it. But again, you don't want to do the 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 great aesthetics for that purpose. You want to get the great aesthetics for getting them in the door. Yeah. And um, again, if you're into rat's tail point, yeah, marketing. That's another topic we could. That's another uh, week's cast topic easily. Yeah. And the issue with marketing is if you don't get your aesthetics right, none of your marketing matters. Yeah, because what are you going to show people? Yeah, you're going to show them, hey, look at this, you know, subpar game, you know, because, I mean, you know, in the general, you know, view of consumers, if your game doesn't have good aesthetics, it is a subpar game. Hey, look oh. at this subpar game, you know, come and play it. Um, look at this ugly know? game called Ori. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't have good aesthetics, then no amount of marketing you can do you know, will help. I was talking to this marketer the other day and uh, she showed up her game, uh, the game her team was working on, and she was like, you know, there, there's a problem with the aesthetics, but, you know, I was like, yeah, and the problem is, is basically aesthetics is a tool, a weapon kind of mm -hmm. thing. And the marketer is the warrior kind of thing. If you have bad aesthetics, you're sending... You know, yeah. you're sending a marketer out with a spoon for a weapon. Okay. You know, it's a warrior with a spoon. They will be able to do plus one damage, and they add in their base stats to that. And, you know, maybe they'll do, you know, 101 damage. And you, know, you know, and they'll get 101 players. But then when you have good aesthetics, great aesthetics, you got freaking Excalibur. You set out a marketer mm -hmm. with, with Excalibur kind of thing. Oh, they're going to bring you back. Tons and, and tons. Uh, when I when I talk to my friend Eric Johnson, who does the uh, indie bros, like when we talk about PR with him, and about you know some developers will not do any kind of trailer, any kind of art. They'll you know wait until a week before the game comes out to start do marketing. And yet, yeah, it doesn't matter if your game is great; nobody's ever going to hear about it, and it's going to be a failure. Yeah. And again, like when we talk about like retention is such a multifaceted topic. Like we can definitely come back to this. And if anyone has any like specific points about retention, let us know in the comments, and we'll add it to our list. And yeah, and Ratzel, so if you're not on the Discord, mine or Josh, as you should join it. Mm -hmm. um, and we can look at your game and whatnot and see I, it, what we can see. I think we did play his game. I think that crane, that Candy Crush game. I think that's one that we played on. I think not the last week, but the week before, for the indie spotlight. Oh, I think I'm vaguely remembering that. Yeah. And if, Candy Raid, thank you. If it is the one I'm thinking of, the graphics was not great, but they weren't bad. Mm -hmm. But again, the problem, of course, is that not, not bad. bad is not is not enough for a lot of people these days. Yeah, not bad or or even good <laughs> to to the general Steam consumer is is poop. Again, like their bare minimum is Hollow Knight Ori. <laughs> yeah, like so many people, you know, say, 
Hollow Knight is a ugly game, and it's you know. So if you aren't, if the art is not up to Hollow Knight kind of level, then you're get your 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 art is crap according to mm -hmm. a lot of Steam and. Or that person who only who thinks that indie games are just Mario and Donkey Kong. I mean, Project Triad's Donkey Kong, right? It's, it's Donkey Kong and Mario. There we go. One. Perfect. And my final statement for this cast, then, again, retention is very important. Whether you are making a 80 to 100 hour long RPG, an 8 to 10 hour platformer, or even a mobile game that is built around 10 to 20 minutes of play a day. And each one of those categories has its own unique rules and elements you need to follow. But ultimately, again, UI design, user experience design, onboarding, approachability, playtesting, these are all kind of the basics of this. Because if you can't keep somebody invested in your game for 16 minutes, if they can't even unlock, or if the majority of the people who play your game can't even unlock your give me object, your give me achievement, you know, walk out of the first town, then something has gone wrong. And even mm. if your game did sell well, or was at least, you know, got a lot of reviews, you're learning the wrong lessons. You're basically being rewarded for bad behavior. And it may not come back to hurt you on that game, but if you try those lessons again on an even higher budget title and it fails, again, you're going to be completely blindsided because I got all these positive reviews before, but you know only 10% of the people actually played my game. Mm-hmm. And one thing we didn't didn't tackle, and I don't know if we got time to tackle, mm -hmm. is animations. Mm. Because animations, that polish factor, that is very much part of, of retention. Like if you if you you'll have a button that isn't very clicky looking and doesn't make a very clicky sound effect when you click on it, kind of thing, mm -hmm. the game is therefore less retention able. Because you need even the little bits, like a button, to to provide just that little bit of retention. Because if if the buttons aren't clickable, they they don't feel clickable. They they don't feel good. Or or you know the UI is a little bit funky, kind of thing. Or you know any number of you How know many, things. Uh, polish animations can just you know sink you kind of thing well not sink you completely but they will they will they're they're pain points basically mm -hmm. and once a player reaches a certain number of play points they're going to quit playing you know every player has their own hp of how many pain points they mm -hmm. can withstand before they they quit i'm a masochist like, i have extra i have a bonus pool yeah you 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 get the masochism bonus or you know, and gives you a plus plus fifty uh, pain points, mm -hmm. or maybe it's plus a thousand, knowing you. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> you know, every every person has their own you know amount of pain points that they can take, yep. and you know, having a button that's not clicky, it very well can be a pain point for somebody. It won't necessarily be a pain point for somebody, but I would say there's probably. 60 70 percent of people that subconsciously will mm -hmm. consider it a, a pain point they may not you know like you ask them straight up at front probably none of them will care they're probably like i don't care but what? everybody everybody you know um go puts a lot of these big big developers and like really top-notch developers really put a lot into making their buttons really good Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't be doing that for no reason. They do that because it is a pain point when it's not there. Even I if mean, players don't say anything about it. How many uh, indie games have we played where the menus are just like stag, there's no real interaction, they use you know placeholder art and text on things? And that stuff, it may not affect you consciously, but it starts to like, weigh on you about 
why should I keep playing this game? And mm -hmm. again, like these issues that we talk about, they're very understated by a lot of developers, even by consumers. But they're there, and I think your hit point analogy works really well. That for some people, they'll load up a game, this menu looks horrible, uninstall refund. Some people will be like, okay, menu's bad, I can deal with that. Load it up, tutorial's horrible, okay, refund, done. And yeah, this is where I mean, we... Maybe, you know, I think, to, you know, kind of uh, farther on that point is, like, there's critical hits. <laughs> and, and that person who booted up and seeing the menu was bad and that's one of their critical points that was a critical hit on them mm -hmm. and he just did 20 damage and they only have 20 HP and they just instantly refund or with me when the control scheme is horrible or it doesn't or it's like a very bad UI like that yeah. kind of stuff that kills me you those know, are that's, your critical points yeah that's like a 300 point damage for me if your UI is bad and again, this is the issue that we talk about when it comes to this kind of retention and playtesting, that there are going to be people who, they will not care at all. They will take every hit, and they will keep playing your game. That's where we get, you know, the 5 to 10% of people who will play through this game all the way through. But with just a little bit more work, you can maybe get 30% or 50% of people to play your game and be longtime fans. And they're mm -hmm. going to stick around. They may buy your next game. And suddenly, a game that could have been a commercial failure may have succeeded because you've cultivated a fan base and you've done the onboarding and the work to keep those people around. Exactly. And and what keeping them around does, like you said, is gets them to buy your next game. Like, like there is a lot of people that play play games out there, you know, Oxygen Not Included, uh, you know, Don't Starve, all these other games. And there are so many people out there that the second they find out that Clay made another game, they're like, it's a buy. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen the game. You it's don't even bot. know the name of it. You, you, you Well, mm -hmm. it's made by Clay. It's got to be good. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. A super giant. I mean, the second they announced Hades, it was like, Okay, we're buying this game. It's why, again, we talk about companies with names like Nintendo, From Software, Blizzard. That the developers behind FTL. Oh yes, uh, Darkest Dungeon. You know, Red Hook already has a success, whatever their next game's going to be, just mm -hmm. on the name of Darkest Dungeon alone. Exactly. And to again, like as a quick point of marketing, again, all Red Hook games has to say on the trailer for their next game is. From the creators of Darkest Dungeon, that's like seventy percent of the work right there. Yeah, they they put that on the the that would be the first part of their trailer mm -hmm. kind of thing, and th it's done kind of thing. Now then, for anybody who's you know hasn't created Darkest Dungeon or a game that's <laughs> been really successful, you should never put your name or logo or anything at the beginning of the trailer. That should be at the very very end. I think to Rats' point, I think everybody would like a game like that. I think that is the goal of a lot of every developer. No, nah, nobody wants to do anything with that. Everybody just wants to make Kaizo games that don't make any money. And Mario and Donkey Kong. Yeah. Or ugly-looking games like Ori. Yeah. <laughs> but I think with that, I think that is a good point to end, or at least for me. Do you have anything you want to wrap up with? Um... It, it, retention is a whole, you know, is is ties into everything basically. Mm -hmm. It ties into game design. It ties into art. It ties into animation. It ties into sound. It ties into UI. It ties into to UX. It ties into you know programming. Even we didn't really talk much about that, but you know bugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know that prevents retention. That's yeah. anti-retention. You know, um, it ties into all areas of the the game, and you got to you know, like if you want to have maximum retention, you just got to do everything right, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you would just psychologically manipulate people. And 
you know, that's not the way you want to go. You don't want to go that way because people will hate you for that. Mm-hmm. They may play your game for a very long time, but they will hate you. They will hate you with a passion. And, you know, that's kind of where, you know, we, you know, kind of got to draw the line. Don't purposely make your consumers hate you because then you're not going to do so well with your next game. Yeah. Again, you don't want to be shooting yourself in the foot before your game is evening out. Mm-hmm. And I think with that, let us wrap things up because I think we kind of went over time, but this is still, I think, a really great topic. Yeah, I do too. Handling reviews. Do you mean, when you say handling reviews, do you mean running reviews or as a developer, like just like taking the reviews in? I think he means taking the reviews as developers, and that's okay. a really good... Mm-hmm. Topic that we we took we hit on a little bit of that today with yeah. the you know the poop and the gold nuggets gold analogy. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, we can add. I think we can add that one to the list. I think that's another like mega topic for sure. Yeah, we might be, do that next week, and All we right. can talk more about poop and nuggets of gold. <laughs> All right, but. With that, we're going to end things for our weekly live show. So thank you for everybody watching this live or recorded. I took a comment from last week that I'm going to include timestamps for when we get to the major topic. So that will be in the description down below going forward to make it easier for everybody to just jump to when we actually have our, you know, hour and a half long design talk. But Yeah. Also, I would put notes and use that new feature on YouTube that, that allows you to, like, segment stuff where you put the, you know... This was the new, the weird game segment. This was the mm-hmm. news, and this is like the main topic kind of thing. Yeah, Do just that. like timestamp it all around there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, as always, you can follow me on Twitter at GW Blazer. We have our Discord and Patreon link down below, and you'll also find there Sharks Discord, Twitter, and I think. Do we have anything else from you down there? I uh, should have my YouTube. Uh, let's see. Yeah. My Twitter, my Discord, my Twitter, and my YouTube channel, which I am very active on my Discord. So, you know, if you want to really get in touch with me, that would be the best place. Mm-hmm. You know, Twitter, I check that, you know, once a week or so. <laughs> and because nobody talks to me over there mainly. <laughs> and, you know, YouTube, I haven't put up a video in a while. So. <laughs> I haven't had very many conversations over there, although hopefully soon I'll be starting putting up videos again. Okay. But like I said, the main the main place if you really want to come and talk to me and come and find out about Project Triad and, you know, all the epicness that is in there and how I'm, you know, trying you know, creating a new business model <laughs> and uh, with refining, you know, changing hopefully changing the the Free to play market forever. All right. Check me out on Discord. Okay. Well, I think with that, we'll wrap things up. I'll be back later tonight for our regular game streams. And as always, these shows are every Sunday around starting at 4 4 30 EDT. So, thanks again for watching. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we're going to be on science of games. Until next time, take care. <laughs>